over 700 years before the event, said this. Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness. And when we shall, when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened up his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he opens not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased Jehovah. It pleased Yahweh. It pleased the Lord. To bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he's poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. I thank God that what happened 2,000 years ago or so, it wasn't an accident. It wasn't a good plan gone bad. But the Apostle Paul said in Corinthians, he said he was, he died and he was buried and he was resurrected again according to the scriptures. It was written. It was written. And we come together tonight to celebrate. To celebrate that night. Because if it wasn't for that, if it wasn't for Isaiah chapter 53, I'd be on my way to hell. And you would be too. We, need, we can celebrate. We can rejoice. Somebody says, well, all the cruel and the beating. And the, but, you know, it says here that, that, that God was pleased with the sacrifice. He was pleased with the offering. If they would have done that to me, it would not have pleased the Lord. Because there's nothing in me but sin. But in my Jesus, there was no sin. This year, uh, our Easter, what we call Easter, and I don't like to use the word Easter because Easter is just another name for Ishtar. <laughs> okay. And I, you know how I feel about that stuff. I'm not going to get it. But anyway, uh, our, our resurrection day coincides with the Jewish holiday, which the, the Jewish feast day that God had given in the Old Testament to foreshadow or to look for, uh, toward the, the resurrection. Tonight is the Jewish Passover in 2012. It begins this evening. And another, uh, there's another feast day that begins with that called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that goes for seven days. And there's another feast day that's involved in all that called the Feast of First Fruits. The Feast of First Fruits always comes on the day after the Sabbath during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
which means the Feast of First Fruits always comes on a Sunday, because the Sabbath is Saturday. So this year, the Feast of First Fruits, which looks forward to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, is coming on the day that we celebrate the resurrection. See, if it was up to me, we'd celebrate that every year, but sometimes it doesn't coincide. You know how we get with Easter bunnies and Easter eggs and stuff, you know. We know how we get with our holiday. But that's all right. See, it's not, it's, we ought to celebrate the resurrection every day. Every day I ought to celebrate the fact that I had a God who came here and died for me that I might be accepted in his presence, in the beloved. Every day. Every day. I thought this evening, and I'm not going to keep you long at all, we want to just talk a little bit about the things that happened this night. And, and again, I don't want to belabor the point, but I really don't think Jesus was crucified on a Friday, but that's okay. <laughs> Somebody asked me, I said, you know, why, is it, why do they call it Good Friday? I don't know. Okay, and it really doesn't matter. You know, people get in there, they'll have like, uh, you know, they'll burn somebody to stake for that. But it, it, it's, not, it's not important what day it was. What is important is the fact that he was crucified. Buried and risen from the dead. The events of that night, we've talked about what is called the Last Supper, which is really a Passover celebration, a Passover Seder. Many, many of us have been to Seders, Messianic Passover Seders and so forth. And how they look forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's what John called him when he first saw him, John the Baptist. We know that Jesus was the culmination up until this point from the first Passover, probably 1,400 years before this. Every year, or almost every year, the Jews would celebrate Passover. There were times when they had bad kings and they didn't. But they would celebrate the Passover at the same time every year, and they would take a lamb and they would, a lamb would be slain. Because if you remember in the Old Testament book of Exodus, they would take a lamb and slay the lamb and take the blood and put it on the doorposts and the and the top of the door, in the sign of a cross. And, and anybody who was under the blood was saved from the death angel. There was a picture of what Christ would do when he would come. Shed his blood, so anybody who would be under the blood would be saved from death. They had the Last Supper, they had the, the Passover Seder. They went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And we know when they were in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed and he was, he was under such great pressure that the Bible says he sweat great drops of blood. He said, Father, if it were possible, take this cup from me. Of course, he realized, and Jesus, just like, you know, when, when God asked the question, he already knows the answer. When Jesus asked that question, he already knew the answer. He knew the answer. He knew that there was no other way that mankind could be brought back into fellowship with the Father. We know that he was betrayed and arrested by Judas. We know that he was brought before the religious leaders. If, if you have your Bibles, just, just read a little bit. Uh, turn to Luke chapter 22. and just We're going to read a few passages tonight. Luke chapter 22, we want to start with verse uh, 66. This was probably right around sunrise, maybe 5 or 5.30 in the morning. It says, as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him into their council. Up until this point, Jesus had been maltreated by those who had came to, to take him. And they brought him into where the high priest was and the Sanhedrin. And they asked him, they said, Are you the Messiah? Tell us. Well, for three and a half years... He was preaching, he was teaching, he was healing, he was raising people from the dead. 
He had claimed to be the Son of God. There were times when they actually wanted to stone him because he said he was the Son of God. But now here he is in the court of his, the leaders of his nation. And he said, okay, tell us. Are you the Christ? And Jesus said, if I tell you, you won't believe. <laughs> How many times have you tried to witness the people in? How many times has God demonstrated himself? And they still won't believe. He says, and if I also ask you, you will not answer me nor let me go. Then Jesus said this. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. But when he dropped that line on them, they knew what he was saying. Then said they, there it is. Are you then the Son of God? And he said unto them, you said it. You say that I am. There's some folks that say that Jesus never claimed to be God. You could take him to this verse. He said, yeah. He says, you say that I am. And they said, well, what, that's it. What do we need any further witness? For we ourselves have heard of his own mouth. That's it. He's condemned himself. It was about 6 a.m. And they sent him to Pontius Pilate. Luke chapter 23, it says this. And the whole multitude of them rose and led him unto Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ the King. You see, if they would have just said, This guy's a troublemaker in our nation, Pilate would have shrugged his shoulders and said, Hey, that's not my problem. So they had to mix in this, the, the thing about Caesar. They had to make him be a... a, a a revolutionary against Rome. When Pontius Pilate heard that, he turned to Jesus. He asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him and he said, You said it. Thou sayest it. Yes. Then said Pilate to the chief priest and to the people, I find no fault in this man. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he heard that, he sent him unto Herod, because Herod, that was his, that was his uh, jurisdiction there. It says in verse 8, And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season. He heard about this Jesus. He heard about all the miracles he did. And he said, maybe if I take a look at Jesus, maybe he'll do a trick here. Maybe we'll see a little. Show me something, Jesus. Show me some miracle. And he questioned him in many words, but like a lamb led to the slaughter, he said nothing. He said nothing. About 7 a.m., they sent Jesus back to Pilate. And it says that he was sentenced to death. Look at verse 13, Luke chapter 23. We'll just read through here a little bit. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers said, and the people said unto them, You've brought this man to me as one that perverse the people, and behold, I've examined him before you, and I, I, I found no fault in him. In this man touching those things, whereof you accuse him? No, nor yet Herod, uh, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done in him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. I'll, Pilate figured I'll beat him up, and that'll make him happy, and we'll let him go. For of a necessity he must release one unto them at the feast. And they cried out all the more, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas, who for a certain sedition made in the city, and for murder was cast into prison. These, these people, these leaders of the Jews, chose a murderer instead of Christ. Unless we look upon them and we look down our nose at them, we do it every day. I say, not me. Man, you choose what you watch or what you listen to and what you take in. How many times have you turned your back on Christ for something 
that the world has to offer. They were instant with loud voices, it says in verse 23, requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. And as they released unto them him uh, that for sedition and murder was cast into prison, whom they had desired, but he delivered Jesus to their will. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon Simon, a Cyrenian. Now it's getting to be about 8 o'clock in the morning. Jesus had been subject to abuse for probably about eight hours now since the night before. And he's led away to Calvary. As they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of, the, uh, out of the country. And on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and of women who also bewailed and lamented them. But Jesus turning unto them said, now we always talk about the seven last words, and we're going to talk about them in a minute. But sometimes we miss this one. Listen to what Jesus said. Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green tree, what shall be done in the dry? Jesus was looking forward into, into the centuries following this event and all the things the Jews were going to suffer because they called a curse down on themselves. They literally said, the leader said, His blood be on us. Look at what has happened to the, to the Jewish peoples from that time until this. Ghettos, inquisitions, gas chambers, persecution, scattered all over the world until in 1948 they got their nation again. But for almost 1,500 years, they suffered. And even today, the whole world is against Israel. They called the curse down on themselves. And you all know, I'm not anti-Semitic. I love Israel. I love Jewish things. But they called a curse on themselves. And Jesus saw this. Before he went to the cross, before the seven last words, he uttered these words. He said, don't weep for me, but weep for your nation. I would say today, I'm not a Jew and we don't live in Israel, but we need to weep for our nation. Because our nation has sent Jesus to the cross. Look at verse 32. We'll just read through this passage. And there were two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the other, uh, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Now the first word from the cross, there were seven words that Jesus spoke from the cross, and we've heard these so many times. The first word is this. Jesus said, Father, curse them. Father, you, you take care of them. He said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. Forgive them. The first thing, and you have to... You know, we've seen the movies and seen the pictures. He's hanging on a cross with nails in his hands and feet. He's been beaten and bloody, crown of thorns. We've, you know, and interesting to me, now, I, I just, I always wonder this because, you know, the Holy Spirit that inspired the authors of Scripture did not inspire them to give us a graphic description. You know, we don't read about blood pouring out and all the things that, you know, if you, they used to tell you if you want to write a story, you got to get really descriptive and you got to, so people get a picture in their mind about the way things are. The Holy Spirit didn't do that. He just told us what happened. You can leave it to your own thought. I really think it's not, the details really aren't so important. It's the fact and the word. When he was hanging on that cross in agony, the first thing he said was, Father, forgive them. We could stop there and just, and just take that with us. Because I have a feeling that's the last thing most of us say 
When somebody tries to crucify you, oh, come on. you ever been crucified? <laughs> And I'm not talking about, you know, we're crucified with Christ through faith in the blood of Jesus. That's good. But there are some folks that like to crucify it. If you do something they don't like, or you step on their toes, sometimes they crucify you with their words. Sometimes they try to use other things. If somebody's trying to nail you to a cross, are you willing to say, Father, forgive them? If somebody has ripped you off or done you in or done you under, are you willing to say, Father, forgive them? They don't know what they're doing. We, and if you're like me, the first, that's not the first thing I want to say. In my flesh. But my spirit wants to say, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. They ripped me off. Father, forgive them. They're trying to, they're trying to steal what I got. Father, forgive Forgive them. They're talking about me. They're slandering me. Father, they've, they've betrayed me. They've left me. They've, they've lied to me. They've, they've abandoned me. That all happened to him. And the first words that came out of his mouth as he was suffering, he didn't say it after the cross. He said it on the cross. Father, forgive them. It's about 9 a.m. now. They would say the third hour. We read about how they gambled for his clothes. We read about how he was insulted and mocked. The Pharisees and the chief priests, they're finally getting their day. They're getting their pound of flesh. They, they were for three years, three and a half years, they've been looking forward to this day. They wanted to shut this guy up. Especially after he brought Lazarus back from the dead, after being dead for four days. Man, they said, we got to do something about this guy. They finally got their wish. There he is. He's hanging there. He's dying. Don't have to worry about him anymore. That's what they thought. And they mocked. They they shouted abuse. They shook their heads at him. So you can destroy the temple and build it again in three days, huh? Well, if you're the son of God, save yourself. The leading priests and the teachers of religious law mocked him. He says he saved others. Why can't he save himself? The soldiers mocked him by offering a drink of sour wine. They called to him, if you are the king of Jews, save yourself. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults on him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself. Save yourself. How come you're sick? How come you're going through this problem? How come, why don't you, I mean, if you serve a God, how come you're dealing with all this this stuff you're, you're going through? Anybody ever say that to you? I'll tell you one thing. The devil will say it to you. If you, don't, you know, if you don't find a person who will say it to you, he'll come along and shout that in your ears as loud as he will. What kind of God you serve letting you go through this? By 11 a.m., it says in Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 40, while the one criminal was, was saying, hey, Jesus, if you're who you say you are, I want you to come down. The other criminal rebuked him. He says, don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, he says, we're here because we deserve to be here. We're murderers. We're suffering a penalty for, for, uh, uh, for killing people. He didn't do anything wrong. And he turned to Jesus and he, and he shouted at Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me. Oh, the sinner's prayer. We got the sinner's prayer down. Oh, Lord, forgive me. You know, we have a big, long thing. All he did was say, Jesus, remember me. He had faith to believe. He didn't have time to be baptized. He didn't have time to, to go to, you know, class in, uh, to learn about the doctrine. He didn't have time to join a church. All he, all he had time to do, his, he knew his time was running out. He was at that place where he said, listen, I'm on the edge of eternity. He said, Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are. Just remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the next word Jesus said, I tell you the truth. You will be with me in paradise today. You're going to be there. I've heard your prayer. Wasn't fancy. Couldn't be fancy. He was suffering on the cross like Jesus was. He said, I've heard your prayer. You know, I find out the best prayers we pray are the ones when we're at the end 
of our rope, when we're at the end of the cliff, when we don't have anything else to say, we don't know how to pray, we don't know what to read, we don't know who to call, we don't know anything. All we can do is say, Jesus, remember me. That prayer carries more weight than if you stand up and say all the these and thous and therefores that you can think of for 15 and 20 minutes. It's the prayer that comes from the heart. It's the prayer that comes from a broken heart. It's a prayer that comes from somebody that realizes he's facing an eternity in hell. That's where this thief was. He didn't deserve to be saved. He didn't have time to make restitution. He didn't have time to write a letter of apology to the people that he had harmed. That was all gone. The next word that Jesus spoke comes from the Gospel of John. When Jesus saw his mother standing, this is John chapter 19, verses 26, 27. I'm just going to read my copy. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, the only, the, the ones, the only ones who were at the cross were the women and John. All the other ones, like rats on a sinking ship, they ran. John, the one who Christ loved, the beloved, the one who loved Christ. He was there. And the women were there. The women weren't afraid. That says something. The women were there. He looked down. And when Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple that he loved, he said to her, woman... He is your son. And he said to his disciple, she is your mother. He committed the care of his mother into the beloved John. Now, we really don't know a whole lot about what happened to Mary after this. We know that she was in the upper room when the Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost. After that, we really we lose track of her. There are some traditions, most of which are fallacious <laughs> it turned about noon about 12 o'clock and all of a sudden darkness covered the land it got dark and it wasn't just like a storm cloud dark it got dark and it says in Matthew chapter 27, about 1 p.m., Jesus cried out. It says, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And again, like the other question, Jesus knew the answer. The Father hadn't forsaken him. But there had, there had become a, a gulf. There was a, a separation. Why? Because Jesus took the sin of the world upon him, and God cannot look upon sin. The darkness represented the, the separation between God and man because of sin. And Jesus, who never knew any sin, never knew the guilt of sin, never knew the feeling of what it was like to sin, never knew the feeling of guilt or conviction because he was God in the flesh, he was experiencing something that he had not experienced from all of eternity. What it feels like to be fallen man. Even though he never sinned. See, this is why we celebrate. Because even though Jesus never did anything wrong, he knows how I feel when I do. He knows that he has he experienced that 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 separation that we feel. You know, if you do something wrong to somebody, what happens? There gets like a wall between you. Come on, you know, you've been married long enough, you know what that's like. <laughs> Jesus tore that wall down. He became He didn't become a sinner, but he became our sin. In John chapter 19 and verses 28 and 29, it says this. Jesus knew that everything was now finished. 
And to fulfill the scriptures, he said, I'm thirsty. What were the scriptures? Uh, over in, I believe it's Psalm 69, it talks about him desiring a drink. And by the way, you can see all this in Psalm 22 and in different Psalms where, where this, all, this, all this stuff had been predicted, the parting of his garments and so forth. He said, I am thirsty. A jar of some wine was sitting there, and they uh, soaked a, a sponge in it and put it to his mouth. They offered him one earlier, but he refused it. But he took it this time. They said that, I had read that in that wine, it had a lot of uh, stuff in it that would help a person be numb, or try to numb the pain. And about 2 p.m. to 3 p.m., after he tasted the wine, he said, it is finished. The Greek word, and we've said this before, the Greek word, teltelestai, is the same word that a, a soldier would say when he would plant, when a Roman soldier would plant the, the, the emblem of Rome on a conquered city, finished, done, complete. It wasn't a, a term of surrender. It was a term of victory. Victory in Jesus. And the very last thing he said, he called with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. See, Jesus didn't die and have his spirit go to hell to be tormented like some folks teach. That's a horrible blasphemy. When Jesus died, he put his spirit into the hands of the Father. And let me tell you what happened after he died. A number of things happened. At that moment, Matthew says, when Jesus died, when he gave up the ghost, and he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. You know what happened in the temple in Jerusalem? There was a veil that was about five inches thick of woven fabric. I mean, it wasn't just like a little curtain like we have hanging in our houses. No, it was, it was a thick veil woven. You know, you know what that's like. When Jesus died, the first thing that happened was that veil got torn from top to bottom. Because that veil represented the separation between God and man. And when Jesus died and gave up the ghost and put his spirit in the hands of the Father, a way was opened for all of us to enter into the holy place through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. He was the Passover lamb. He was the, the blood of the atonement. He offered, uh, it says in Hebrews, he took his own blood into the holy place in heaven and offered his own blood so that we can go boldly to the throne of grace. That's something we're celebrating. We haven't even got to the resurrection yet. The veil was split. And listen to this. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Some folks came out of the grave. Started walking through Jerusalem, proclaiming. Now, 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 this event, this is the only thing in all of scriptures that talks about this event. Somebody say, who got out of the graves? I don't know. Somebody else said, they have to go back in? I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't tell us. What did they say? Was that David or Jeremiah? I don't know. You know, that's one of those things in the Bible that that's, that's I wish there would have been the Holy Spirit would give us a little addenda there, but it doesn't tell us. But it happened. Veil was rent. Torn from top to bottom. Graves were open. The Roman centurion, when he saw all this happen, he said, that's the Son of God. We know that the two thieves on one side or the other of Jesus, when Jesus had died, it says that the Roman soldiers went to break their legs. Somebody says, what that's all about? Well, when they were hanging on the cross, they had to push themselves up to breathe. Because when you're hanging like that, it constricts the muscles here. So if a, a person was crucified, uh, sometimes people would last on the cross for days. Uh, as a matter of fact, Pilate was amazed that Jesus had died already. But the other thieves, because they just wanted to end it, they broke their legs so they couldn't put, push themselves up to breathe. So it was at, like an act of mercy when they did that. They did that, and they came to Jesus, and they found out he was dead already. So the soldier pierced his side, and out came blood and water. We know that Jesus was laid in the tomb. Three days later, he rose from the dead. But there's something else that happened that we read about a few other places. When Jesus committed his spirit into the hand of the Father, 
You know what happened to his spirit while, that, while he laid in that tomb for three days? He went into hell. Now, when we hear the word hell, what do we think of? We think of fire and brimstone and so forth. But in the Old Testament concept of hell was not just flame and punishment. It was, it was a place of the dead. It was, it was the grave. And in, before the cross and before the blood was offered, everybody went into Sheol, the grave. So we would call hell. And there were two compartments. There was one called Abraham's bosom, which was the nice place. And then there was a place of torment. If you read in Luke chapter 16, the story of the beggar and the rich man uh, and so forth, he talks about you know, Lazarus going into Abraham's bosom. Jesus went to that place called hell. He didn't go there to be tormented. He didn't go there to be tortured. He didn't go there for the devil could have a good time with him. He went that, he marched into hell. Just imagine marching into darkness, the light of the world, marching into darkness, proclaiming his victory that he had won on the cross. The victory was done on the cross. When he said it is finished, he said it's finished. There's no more to do. He marched into hell. And he went to that Abraham's bosom where all the Old Testament saints were. And he said, come on, guys. Now you can enter into the presence of the Father. Now you can go be with your God. They couldn't go there before because the blood had not been offered. That was a holding place. But he said, come on. And it says over in Ephesians that he led captivity captive. And he took him to heaven. So that's why now we can say, see, if it were before the cross, and we say, absent from the body, in shoal. If it was before the cross in the Old Testament. Absent from the body, I'm going to be in hell. I'm either going to be in Abraham's bosom, or I'm going to be in a place of torment. But now we can say with the Apostle Paul, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Why? Because Jesus offered his blood once and for all. We don't have to go to the temple anymore. We don't have to go make an ark, a fake ark, and, and offer stuff to it. We don't have to do the feast days. We don't have to do the, the ceremonies. We don't have to do all that anymore because it's been done once for all by Jesus. It's okay to talk about them. It's okay to reenact them and, and explain what they mean according to Christ. But we don't need to do that anymore. All we need to do is believe and trust in him and what he did on the cross. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant. That is offered for the forgiveness of sins. He went into hell. He led captivity captive. So now we can say, absent from the body, present with the Lord. We know he came back. He was here for 40 days after his resurrection. Hanging out with the disciples, teaching them. And the last thing he told them before, he was ascended. And you read this in Acts chapter 1. The last thing he said was, listen. You go to Jerusalem. And you wait. Until the promise of the Father. Before he was crucified, he told his disciples. He said, I'm going away. And his disciples said, don't go away. He said, no, it's a good thing I'm going away. Because if I go away, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send you another comforter. The Holy Spirit. Forty days after his resurrection... He told his disciples, he said, you go back to Jerusalem and you wait for the promise of the Father. I'll see you later. And he went up in the clouds. And as all his disciples were looking up, and they were saying, a couple of angels came and said, why are you sitting there looking in the sky? He'll come back. It was on the Mount of Olives that he went up. He said, you're going to come back. And the Bible says he's going to come back on the Mount of Olives. He's going to come back just like he went up. You go do what he said to do. And they went to Jerusalem and they waited. And 10 days later, a sound like a rushing mighty wind. And the Holy Spirit was given. See, that's why we celebrate. I celebrate, I celebrate the crucifixion of Jesus Christ because of the fact that he died. He took my sins on him. He was, he was bruised for not my iniquities. By his stripes I am healed. And I have a hope of eternity. In the meantime, he sent me a comforter that I have dwelling inside of me, the Holy Spirit. Whether I preach or whether I sit at home, whatever I, I go on a mission field or go out on the street, whatever I do for him, I have been filled with the Holy Spirit. And now I have a hope of eternity. So I wait for him. And while I'm waiting for him, I'm, I'm about his business. How about you? That's what this whole thing's about. Now, see, we haven't even got really to the resurrection. Sunday morning, we're going to be celebrating the resurrection. That's going to be a real good time. In the meantime, have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood 
of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Won't you stand with me, please? Yes, I'm washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb. And my garments are spotless. Yes, they're white as snow, and I'm washed. In the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood? Are you trusting in His grace? Not only for your salvation, we're trusting for His salvation, but how about, how about your holiness? How about how you live, your sanctification? Those things you've been wrestling with, those things you've been dealing with, do you believe that Jesus is able to set you free and deliver you from the things that have bound you? Do you believe you can uh, cast down the strongholds in the name of Jesus Christ? Do you believe that he's able to heal your body? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for the blood that was shed. We thank you, Lord, that you've seen fit to have mercy on us. That, Father, you've allowed us in our lives to come to a place, to a saving knowledge of you. Father, it's not because we've deserved it, but because of your mercy and your grace. Father, as we go from this place tonight, help us remember what this season is about. Help us remember why we've gathered here tonight. Father, to worship you. And we thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness of our sins and the hope of eternity. And for, Father, for the callings that you've placed on our lives, that we may be, this time that we spend here might be used for your glory. We thank you for the gifts and the callings, the talents and the abilities. And we ask you, Lord, to help us use them, Father. Make us holy. Make us righteous. By the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Shake somebody's hand and greet each other.